you know, what is sovereignty and and this idea of, you know, defining your own space and universe. We can talk a bit more about it today, things like date and time and how they play a crucial impact. That's awesome. Differentiating and person and trusts and companies and all of that. So there's a lot there's a lot of moving pieces to the the puzzle, but I think um, that's a resource that I definitely want people to be able to get their hands on. And it's been a while to be updated. Um, you know, the first version was done probably eight, nine, ten years ago. And what this is doing is kind of separating some of the historical material and just focusing on the mechanics of architecture and design and just trying to make it a lot clearer for people. So, Frank, you, meant, you, you just mentioned about um, positive law. Could you define uh, what positive is? Because I don't think that's a, uh, a very used uh, term. Is it related oh. to, the, uh, I, I assume it's the different layers of law and positive law is the one closest to statutory law? What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share with, with you, I'll post this to you via um, uh, Skype. Um, and I'll make this available to the to the group. Um, keep in mind, this is a section of a text that's coming up, but this is the introductory section to the new version of positive law that UK is publishing. And I'm just going to put it in there because I think it it really answers um, answers a lot of questions that people have as far as what do we mean by positive law, civilized law. Um, so I'm going to put this through to you right now. It's a PDF. That's uh, great. It's just the opening section. And, and let me, I'm just let going me to just, put it uh, Let me just say to people listening that uh, we are using the uh, – let's use the whiteboard AMA, which is uh, just above the community. Um, and we're going to try and make this as a dynamic and engaging um, converse, conversation. So any questions you have, please just share them in there. And um, that would be great. Um, so there's a Frank. PDF that I've just posted to you in your um, Skype, which is the okay. introductory book. Share that. So just for people, keep in mind, there are 20 sections of positive law. This is the introduction. But I feel this gives you and the group, gives the group the best introduction to many of the concepts we started to talk about last week and we talk about today on what is civilised law? What is law in itself? But what is civilised law? In fact, what is uncivilised law? That's a comparison that you almost never, in fact, not almost, you never hear. People talk about it. It's not rule of law. It's not just. It's not fair. It's overreach. We've all come out of COVID. We've seen that. But how do you define that? People know what it feels like, but... Can you find a document that quantifies it unemotionally and objectively as a reference? And this is really what you're about to see. So you, you're the first group, really, to see what is coming out in the next few months. So I, I hope you all um, find it uh, useful to read and, and introduce. Awesome. Um, and Frank, okay. I was hoping in this mm. hour, in this call. Um, based on um, some feedback and interesting discussions we've had to help add some color to the um, the history of how um, financial and legal systems came to be um, the role um, the, how pirates in relation to uh, nations uh and offshore um and how that relates to how that how that came how that started like offshore trusts i think that's quite that was quite interesting you also, sure. you also men mentioned the relation of the titles of the queen and things like that so that, so can we can we and there's also some acts that you you could possibly share in in that absolutely absolutely well look i'm going to put another one in which you can um, share. Look, you've still got it. Is it easy for you to pull up the Venetian double entry bookkeeping? Basically, the first white paper on uh, on uh, one of the first white papers on money by the Venetian Empire back in the 
the 14th or 15th century. Have you still got that there? Okay. I would like to start with um, if people are able to download that document which you posted onto the whiteboard um, so they've got it because I would love to refer to that. Um, again, it, I, I'm sorry if there are still typos. It's still a work in progress. But I think it, it gives people an excellent intro. I'm just going to put this in so we can follow up on those questions of history and money and power and how it goes. So here we go. Just get this uh, banking second Venetian. Here we go. Venetian bookkeeping. So I'm just going to put that in there. Yep. So that's a good one. So what you're um, saying, so basically Venetian bookkeeping is the, is the standard of accounting that we use today. Yeah, and, it's, and it was invented. It was invented because um, the Venetians uh, discovered a way of guaranteeing early banks had a problem. The biggest customers in the world were countries, were kingdoms, were kings, queens, and despots. Yeah? And the problem that banks had and in fact, the problem that every bank has is what happens when your major customers default. Yeah, and we're, we're in an environment now. We're talking about volatility and people going to halts and all kinds of questions of um, uh, solvency. And the Venetians and their competitors, who are the Genoese, both coming from the original Pisan Empire, um, that essentially ruled both the East and the Western Mediterranean up until their civil wars in the 13th century. Their problem was that, that over and over again, kings, as some countries have done, they just simply say, I'm not going to pay. Yeah? So what the Venetians came up with, and this is the birth of modern accounting, and I mention that because of the core accounting relationship with crypto, that it's essentially it's it's reason for identity of the value is that accounting equation. To them, accounting was a way of guaranteeing that their loans would never be rejected, and that was the concept of bankrupting a country, bankrupting a kingdom. That's what the Venetians invented. Accounting is a means of keeping track of that, not the other way around, okay? Accounting was created for the purpose of managing bankruptcy, not the other way around. It wasn't about being more accurate. If you think about it, it, it kind of makes sense. You don't, in those days, you, you don't need accounting if you've said to someone, this is what you owe me and pay me, you yeah? You don't need to worry about all these receipts and bills and, you know, how much do I have and how much do I own? That's, that's the small stuff. To banks in those days and to pirates as banks and pirates as kings and princes. It, it, it didn't matter. But once you put someone into bankruptcy, yeah, and now you're using the fact that you've got them, it, you're, you're essentially saying we're providing the credit because you ran out of money and what we will do now is we'll supply you with all the money you need on the condition that we essentially control your treasury. That's what it is. That's what an exchequer is then accounting becomes critical. Um, verifying becomes critical. This, this is all the invention of blockchain in the physical off-chain off world before it ever became blockchain. And it's, yes, it's centralised, but you know, it, accounting is a decentralised concept. So it was able to be spread out across a kingdom or a realm and you have tax collectors and people. So that text that I've sent to you, Venetian bookkeeping, is key to understand. Now, under bankruptcy, you invert. So credit becomes debt and debt becomes credit. Yeah, you invert it. And it's why if you've ever been blessed or cursed trying to learn accounting, it never makes, it, it never makes sense from a real world perspective. You, you learn it from accounting and you accept it and say, I, I know it now and then you move on and do your accounting. But your first experience in coming face to face with accounting, I hope people have the same thing. You go, this just kind of doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah. And that's because in, in bankruptcy, there's only really, there are no actual physical assets in play. They're all locked up. They're all locked like tokens. That's the whole point of bankruptcy. Again, the model of locking 
comes from this model of bankruptcy. You lock things up. The only two assets in play are what people will promise to do or what people are bound to do, um, debt notes, uh, bonds, whatever you like. They're the only two assets. I promise to do or I have to do. They're the only two assets that are on the table and everything else is locked away. And so the Venetians came up with this and it's actually the, the secret to the renaissance of the Venetian Empire for another 250, 300 years before it metamorphosized into England. A lot of people don't know that um, in the battle uh, where the Venetians essentially lost, many of the families were exiled and many of them found their way to England. And people don't realise that a lot of the fancy uniforms you see around England originate from Venice. Right? Uh, because essentially these families from Venice with still huge like, personal fortunes um, ended up in England at the time of Henry VIII. Um, and again, if, if, if people look at Henry VIII and think he was a, a master of a, a brilliance, but let's put it in perspective. Prior to the Venetians and prior to Henry VIII, the English had something like, I think, four or five ships that could fire cannons. That was it. The main military um, expertise of England prior to Henry VIII was as mercenaries, not a navy. Scotland had a, a navy 50 times larger than England up north. England had no navy. In fact, Greenwich and that original place d d further down the, the Thames was where they built the first warships. The Mary Rose was the fleet ship of, of a fleet built by the Venetians. Huge sums of money, huge, huge in those days, all done by creating the accounting system in England that worked extremely well called the Exchequer. That's what, that's what that is. It's a... It's an, it's a institution embedded in the crown to manage the accounting of England and what Henry VIII was able to do was he was able to convert people into a much more efficient collateral and that took it to another level. But now, now that was the British Empire because these Venetian families were exiles. So we can talk about that history but it, all, all these things have a I think that people need to understand everything has a provenance that you're dealing with now. Nothing's in isolation. The danger is losing perspective because you're always looking in when you're doing stuff, not necessarily looking out or up or, or back, yeah? And, and rather than just sort of throwing things at, at people and saying, here's this, here's that, here's the history, there's actually an underlying reason for all this. And it comes back to something I've been discussing with Ramsey and, and some of you who I've had the honour to talk to, the idea of instituting real substantive elements into dissent communities that are principles of sovereignty, that are principles of independence, that are principles of sustainable communities rather than kind of a fad, a phase, a burst, you know, a flaming great time, <laughs> you know, it was fun while it lasted, you know, which some people think, um, as you, I'm sure you all know, some people think that's what blockchain is or crypto is, yeah? So in order to understand that, the notes that I've shown you on the introduction, which are really written in a way that you don't need any legal background. A lawyer can read that, a, an average person can read that, and you can read through the sections of introductory definitions of positive law and get a picture. But... Um, there's a context to it. And so today, in this chat, you've seen one document, the Venetian Bookkeeping, uh, the first white paper, <laughs> um, and then these introductions, which talk about, well, what is law? Why is law? Um, what are the principles of law? And most importantly, what are not the principles of law? What are the uncivilized, immoral behaviors? I said something last week, uh, and then I'll... I'll come back to Q&A. Um, I said something last week, and I think it's cr crucial. Law is moral. Moral is law. That's not me pontificating. That's just what law is. Law is moral. Moral is, is law. And 
one of the hard things in growing up, particularly when you've had a good run, is realising that you can't keep one foot in each camp. You can't play pirate and then be moral tomorrow. You, you have to start making decisions. Now, there's still plenty of space to do pirate things and see things go up and take off and hopefully make a lot of money if that's what you want to do. But sustainability always, throughout our history, on everything and anything, is always rested on setting up the right set of rules. How they function is what decentralised descent is all about. The idea of decentralisation is if your rules are good enough, you can function. Otherwise, it's, it's, um, it's George Orwell, it's, it's Animal Farm, it's, it's Lord of the Rings, right? It's, it's something chaotic that ultimately um, is not utopia, it's dystopian. So rules and law as moral is not kind of antithetical to the future. It's actually prerequisite in setting up true, autonomous, liquid democracy, decentralised, long-term structures, sovereign structures. So there's a lot of words there and I don't know if thanks, well, thanks hopefully that, people, yeah. That yeah. was awesome. That was awesome. Um, um, so you've you've introduced um, the concept of um, uh, how the Venetians started um, a double entry bookkeeping, and that is shared in the a AMA, uh, the whiteboard AMA channel. So have a look there, and also give, provide some feedback, and just let let us know you're 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 there listening actively. And so and so you've. Um, so that's really interesting how you've kind of ha of the, the beginning history of of our of accounting and how does that how and does money that relate, and money and money and so how does that relate to law and then and of course the financial system and how how are they linked you 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 also um, landed on Henry the Eighth and what was sure. significant at that time um, and because well, we so I guess we are living in a, in a system today that is. Yep still a result of the decisions that were made then. And so it would be great to kind of um, um, learn more about that and how it ties in. Okay. Well, every, every, again, taking a telescopic view to understand what's going on. Um, I think, again, given the time, given what's happening at the moment, given the audience, I don't want to fluff around things with you. I want to be able to give you what I can see and, and share with you honestly what is my opinion. And I, I want to get your feedback. I want to get people's feedback. So I think a couple of things. Uh, money is and has always been power. The economic ability to control trade has been a central element even before the Hyksos in Egypt. Uh, whereas the Hyksos excelled, uh, they in fact invented paper money. That's where it came from in the temples at uh, Karnak and Thebes, all the, I mentioned this last week, if you ever look at the, the uh, certain temples that were temples for commerce, the difference, you actually see them in Greece, the difference between a, a temple that was for worship and a temple for commerce is a temple that was used for commerce has an inordinate number of pillars. You might see this in some structures. You think, why would you put pillars where people are supposed to walk. It doesn't make sense, yeah? So you look at some of these old Greek temples and there's literally pillars every X number of feet or metres apart and, and, and you don't need that many load-bearing structures to keep the roof up. They, they seem superfluous and no one have questioned that. And the reason is those pillars from the time of the Hyksos were the trading bourses, they were the locations of physical locations one pillar would be the trading bourse for sheep one would be the trading bourse for wheat one would be the trading bourse for slaves one would be the trading bourse for spices and so that's how it worked and when you walked into a, a temple you would change your coins to notes paper paper money and that's how you would exchange you didn't bring your sheep in there was no room for sheep in the temple um, you would go in with, and that's the money changes. They're your first banks. That's what the money changes are. They're the banks, or that's what it is, the bench. Bench, 
is derived from the word bank, bank, yeah? That's where it comes from. So the first banks are the are money lenders. The point is that every age forward, money is power. And we spoke about this last week. And we live in an age where money is, is worshipped as a god. Rarely in history have people been allowed to do that so openly, but it's always been tacitly. The golden calf is a reference that always lurking behind the scenes, money has always been worshipped as ultimately the kind of real power because from money you can build, as we said, Henry VIII's got huge IOUs from the Venetians who bankrupted England and then turned it, converted it, used everyone as collateral. The origin of the Sesta KV is part of that structure to underwrite the, the largesse of Henry VIII. Um, and he built warships from that. He built palaces from that. He did whatever he wanted from that. Yeah. So, so money. Hmm, go. Explain what the Sesta KV is. Well, the, the concept. People, and we, we talk about this often, and, and I think it gets lost sometimes, but what actually underwrites tokens, money, in its practical form, in its use form? And I think we'll be careful n not to forget that there's different layers of money. A US dollar bill is littered, absolutely bursting with occult symbols, which tells you that there's more to money than just meets the eye, no pun intended. Uh, you're seeing I. But what people, when they look at money and, and law, is law is there in one sense to monopolize the minting of money. That's part of the, the ethos of every empire that they controlled the tokens. That was key. They controlled the tokens. Um, what underlines, what underwrites money. Um, in a practical sense, as opposed to an ethereal or power or historical sense, is our effort. Yes, it's our confidence, but ultimately it's what we do. It's our energy. It's, it's, it's what we build, what we consume, that ultimately determines a, um, a big factor. We, we, we call it called sweat equity, et cetera, et cetera. So Venetians now starting by the 16th century to get quite good with bankruptcy accounting and looking for new markets, and this is a, a way that they turbocharged it, having been kicked out of their own city and place and now refugees living in, um, in uh, wonderful England. So they're looking at this and they're saying, how do we get the king to essentially guarantee his loans where this is not going to blow up in us, in our face, particularly with a king that's got a spending problem? And it was the creation of the estate. This is where the concept of the estate and even the concept of trust comes in. It's the idea that um, I can hypothecate your value based on your status in life, your, your education, and I could then use that as an asset by arguing um, in one sense that if you're off or you're not smart enough or you are stupid or you don't care about this, then I can then claim to be your custodian in one sense, the custodian of your potential wealth. Now, to kind of even out the balance, what I needed to do was introduce the concept of welfare. Again, one of the features of an estate. Um, the idea that if I take it all, then there's no question it's, it's evil, immoral. But if you give something back and then argue that you're an idiot, infirm, lost at sea, unknown, then in a way I've kind of there's – there's a phrase in the Babylon Talmud that talks about rabbis essentially trying to trick God. And this is kind of what we're seeing. And, and there's an argument that some of those texts originate in full-scale print out of Venice. This idea that I'm kind of tricking heaven – because I'm giving a bit of welfare and they're too stupid to see what I'm doing. And that's actually been a feature of, of, of the global system ever since, is kind of hoping that people really don't care what's going on, who they are. They get enough to be happy. Occasionally we'll, we'll, we need to sandbox to learn. We're in a sandbox environment at the moment. 
that's what crypto, as I said to you last week, no one asked the question, what's the boundaries of cryptocurrency? Well, it's part of the same system. There is no, it's in the digital, but the digital verse it's in could, could just as well be called the, the US federal verse or the Bank of England verse or the Davos verse or the, or the BIS verse, because that's what we're all part of. We haven't defined, well, I have, and UK has, but, but cryptocurrency hasn't accepted that necessity of defining its space. So it's a sandbox, and time to time there are social sandboxes, the 60s, we're in a monetary sandbox at the moment. So the system learns, it acquires that knowledge, it, it, it transforms itself, it, it develops it, and then it closes the sandbox down. That's what it, it's done. That's what the Venetians have done for hundreds of years. So I don't know if I kind of, did I answer the question or did I sort of go a bit too off there? No, that was well, that you, you covered yeah. a bunch there, but just to go back to the to Sesta KV, so um, that what came so around. So Sesta KV is, is, a, is a Latin phrase, yeah. So it's it's it, Sesta KV is essentially um, uh, uh, on one's life, yeah. It's so on on someone's life, and it's the concept that the state steps in now and acts in a benevolent way, and I. Air quotes on that benevolent way, yeah, in providing services to people who are poor or lost, abandoned, etc., wards of the state, and so on. Um, and in in response to that, the state is allowed to manage the assets that would otherwise be available to someone if they were competent, if they were not a minor, if they weren't incapacitated mentally. And that has been the kind of running class distinction. Uh, again, what was, the intention, of, what yeah. was the intention of it in, in Henry VIII time? Because you, you mentioned they lost at sea. So well, the, for people lost... Well, the lost Venetians people, wanted... Well, it's a, well, up until the 19th century, um, half the sailors that ever went to sea died, usually of scurvy and lack of vitamin C. So lost at sea was a real, a real a reality. Yeah, it's been a reality up until the 20th century. Um, no, they just wanted a, a they wanted an excuse to underwrite their loans. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been, an excuse to underwrite loans. But it's all wrapped up in mystery and ritual and so on. But it's, it's essentially taking a large portion of your energy, most of your energy actually, to be harnessed to run their system that you agree to participate in for whatever you're given. I mean, that's so what, that's, what that's it. What underwrites a country? This system has, has done. I'll give you an example of the League of Nations. So, again, people, some people know history, some people, and I, again, I'm not, we all know what we know. We all have skills, and we're talking to an amazingly skilled bunch of people. I'm certain we are. What people forget is the League of Nations didn't just disband. The League of Nations was a was a concept born out of um, born out of the um, end of World War One, and then brought into uh, being. And the idea of it was, was to end global warfare. It was uh, it was it was the prototype for United Nations. The thing with the League of Nations is it disappeared in the global depression. So after 1933, when America withdrew from the gold standard, it essentially destroyed the underlying currencies of virtually every other country. Almost every other country, except for the United States uh, and England uh, and Switzerland, were broke. They were bankrupt. And what the League of Nations then became is the United Nations. Now, the United Nations, in its form, if you think about how do I get a bunch of nations to cooperate, is they cooperate at one level because they were essentially, United Nations operate at one level as, through the IMF, as administrators of global bankruptcy. So a modern country is running on exactly the same system as the Venetians, but on a massively larger scale. And people... There's a lot of red herrings out there where people kind of lose track and they'll go down a path and, and then they'll hit a barrier where someone says, 
absolutely no way, in no, in, in no shape or form, do we sell birth certificates. Well, here's the thing. The SEC, and you know, well, I'm sure they're well known by crypto communities, have a system called EDGAR, the SEC EDGAR system. Yeah? And whilst you can't see every country, you can't see the United States on there, you can certainly see Australia and you can see some of the top 10 global economies there, France and others. Yeah? And when you look at the history of the documents on EDGAR, firstly what you find is a country is registered on the SEC. Yeah. What you find periodically is the countries are selling bonds. They're selling bonds on, on the SEC. And the question and, and if you look at the report, they don't hide the fact that they um, extrapolate out the value of their citizens and resources and convert them into financial instruments. They don't hide it. it they're there. It's just that they refuse to acknowledge it in a public forum. And they have refused to accept that all the, the pieces um, used to be in pu full public view. Some pieces have gone. You used to be able to look up your own bond, by the way. You used to be able to go find your own bond, birth, you know, birth is we convert into a bond and, and find it and see what it was worth. That was shut down. It's no longer public now. You can only see it through certain um, websites that they have access to. But it used to be public, yeah? So... Um, that's the same system. It's, it's Cessica V's are alive and well. People are hypothecated. The bonds go in. It's the underwriting of the, of the global system, and that's what runs it. And they're not changing it. They're not stopping it. They don't want to, and they, and they won't. They simply won't stop it. Not until – and this is the problem, is, is they don't see it as a problem. They just see it as the way of doing business. So, so how does the court system tie into – into this, if that's a... Well, it, well, it ties in because the, the, the courts manage rights. I mean, if you think about what a court does, a court manages rights. So we think we're born with rights. We're born into a England or Australia or United States or New Zealand or Europe. And what a court is essentially doing from the high court down in England, in the high court in, or Supreme Court in America, high court in Australia. What about India? What about Asia? Well, in did they have all have Supreme Courts? Virtually everyone uses the same system. Yeah, they change the court names. They've sometimes they have funny procedures, but they all generally follow the same playbook. Um, you are land in their system. Land is not some piece of property. You are land. That certificate. So you are divided. In the financial system, you are divided into pieces. Yeah, you're separated. You know, your your soul goes theoretically into the gold reserves. Yeah, your mind goes into the rights of law, and you become a land certificate. Your body becomes a, a bond. You know, the, the the engine, the machine that's producing the energy, the taxes, which is the payment on the rent of these. Instruments. That's that's what we've set up to do, and the system's been very successful. I mean, it's lasted for as long as it has. The problem is, um, the management of this system sucks, absolutely sucks, and the people who've been running it have done a a, a terrible job in apportioning resources. So you AKA, look at the world. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So you mentioned there that we div they divided the person into pieces. Mm -hmm. You said the soul. It wasn't, it, it wasn't created by bankers by this stage. <laughs> they, they, they were too busy being bankers. Um, it was invented by people that saw that they had a, a part to play. And, I, and the reason I'm hesitating to go straight up is I want to say that there are changes in their system that have happened, significant changes in their system. The problem we have at the moment is we have a decoupling. The people that created the Frankenstein, no longer control the Frankenstein in one sense, if that makes sense, yeah? The people that created this are no longer running this in a sense. It, it has a life of its own. And there's so many layers to middle management before it gets down to us that they're quite happy, that the merchant banks are more than happy with this system. Do, run with it every day, twice on Sunday, 
commercial banks, happy to run with it. Senior military figures, happy to run with it. There's a few that, that don't, but a large portion of that middle layer is quite happy, you know, selling off parts of the prison system to their friends or the land titles office to their friends or to sell pharmaceuticals, rights to make the Chinese. People are doing that and have been doing that now and doing really nicely personally that they have no interest in, in reforming it. So I think the people that created it, um, in a sense, if you, if you start naming names, then, then you start essentially misdirecting blame. Right. That's my concern. Does that I, make I learnt, sense? I learned, uh, yes, I, I, I learned that um, the like original, that a lot of these systems came out from the um, from the Catholic Church, um, and that mm -hmm. the Catholic Church was the original corporation and brand, if you will. Sure. Well, the original company um, is is part of people that originally uh, were part of this. But again, the, the danger in the internet um, is guilty of this all the time, people make a logical fallacy. They look and say, these people created it, therefore they're to blame, therefore they're in charge. They're not in charge. I come back to, to where we are today. The global financial system, the only, there are only a few things in the global financial system that unify. One used to be SWIFT. And I say used to be because that system was blown up, both in credibility and function when one of the 10th largest economies in the world was cut off. And I know why they were cut off, because of the, the war, but what they did is it, it actually was an own goal to their own system. There's very few structures that unify the global financial system. Think of it as consortiums of pirates is the best way to describe the global financial system. And that's really what it is. It's consortiums of pirates that kind of interact in a kind of gentrified way but at the end of the day, they're pirates. They're into the drug trade, war. War is their biggest profit margin. War, military, slave trade, wage slaves. Um, basically, the same things are in business for hundreds of years ago. Yeah? So I'll give me an example. Yeah, give, 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 give the group an example. Because you hear this stuff and you go, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, okay. United States of America. Is a, is a really good example for this, and I'm, I'm happy to talk on this one. So if you've seen any movie, even if you don't know the economic status of America, if you see any movie of, of early America fighting the British, no one can conclude that they were military sophisticated, that they were well-equipped, well-armed, um, certainly well-intentioned, but they certainly weren't um, at the top of the, top of the military tree. Against an empire... The French Empire, even the, the you know, uh, David Crockett and the Mexicans was no match, right? And the, even, uh, the historians even tell you that, you know, the, the Mexican military was far more sophisticated than the, the Texans, yeah? So you look at America, and the Dutch originally held New York. And a lot of people know that. A lot of people know that the original name for Manhattan Island was New Amsterdam, and it was owned by the most powerful, the largest corporation, dominant corporation the world has ever seen, the Dutch East India Company. In today's terms, if, if you valued the Dutch East India Company t today, it would be worth 20 trillion. I mean, it was vast. It had 5,000 ships, standard ships, in the end of the 18th century, and of those, at least 600 of them, more, were military. So it actually had the largest naval force on the planet. And in those days, uh, naval transport was the essence of trade. It was, if you control the water, you control the world. Well, people, I don't know, it's one of those things we kind of miss. If you look at um, the end of the rise of Napoleon, when he attacked uh, the Netherlands, he essentially uh, took the base of the Dutch East India Company. And then within the same time period overnight, America goes from one of the poorest places to 
the world power it still is today. The largest banking empire, the largest naval force, the largest economic force on the planet. For some reason, people don't understand or see or make the dot, connect the dots, so to speak. Yeah? But the connection there is that the Dutch East India Company purchased back Manhattan Island and set up shop on the east coast of America. And the origin of all those banks in Wall Street is the Dutch East India Company. And their business model was drugs, arms, slaves, spices. They were the four major things and financial annuities, financial instruments. That's what the, that's what the Dutch East India Company was founded on. So all these things are in plain sight and the modern world still operates in the financial banking world, still operates as these consortia, the largest being still America. And you, and you shared an act that um, instantiates um, the, uh, uh, an act from uh, British Parliament in the 1700s that helped set up, that was after the independence of the, the formation oh. of the United States. Yeah. As the true day that, or recognised as a July the 4th, yeah? But not 70. In seventy six, Act of West Act of Westminster. Do you want me to? Do you want me yes, to call that, put that in? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. All right, I'll pull that in. Yeah. So it's just there's quite a few, and we can talk with a group in future if people are interested on that about how the modern banking system came to be today. There are lots of elements to do it, but the key thing to understand is the financial system of the world has always been done at a macro level, never at a micro. And today, blockchain or cryptocurrency is a sandbox. It's a sandbox for the system to learn, to acquire that knowledge, to determine what they want to continue with and to move on. And then, as I have always done, they'll close that sandbox off. They did the same with uh, early um, financial instruments, loans and savings. Do people remember loans and savings? I don't think people remember that. Do people remember young. that? We're too young. For okay. That. All right. All right. Okay. To prove to you that you're living today in a sandbox that has a use by date and will close off if if we collectively don't get our act together. Yeah. And and I don't know how long it's on for. I don't think it's imminent, but I I think I think bin fires are being lit deliberately to narrow it down, certainly, to bring it back into a manageable level, to make it easier to, to basically shut down, if you like. Um, in, in America, when mortgages and securitized mortgages started to um, grab hold, it was the birth of what we now know as derivatives. Yeah? And this was something that happened essentially at the late 70s, early 80s, coinciding with new computing systems. So now with computers and these types of tools, um, it was possible to introduce new financial instruments that essentially created more money. And by creating more money, there was more opportunities for that to be moving around the economy. Sounds familiar? New ways to create money? And that's what savings and loans were. So America largely took it upon itself to make America the sandbox. So really the peak of this was, was the peak and the, and the end of the sandbox was during the Reagan era, yeah, before it moved in. Um, so in a space of very short time in America, tens upon tens of thousands of companies started up as savings and loans. Again, does that sound familiar to what we're talking about with blockchain? Yeah? Tens of thousands on this idea of this new idea that we could essentially create derivatives of our loans um, that created more money and we could essentially create a perpetual money machine, yeah, a, a, an algorithmic money machine using the new fangled thing called computers, yeah, at that point, or PCs and, and so on. The problem was that savings and loans was um, largely unregulated. Sound familiar? Yeah. Wasn't many laws around. 
Are we ringing a bell here? Uh, um, and then when it came to the end, there was a huge crash. One might argue that it was, it was uh, confected and argued. Um, most of them went to the wall. The rest got highly regulated. The sandbox was over. And that's a, a recent example of the system, in that sense, learning how to manage derivatives. Now, GFC, fast forward, you could argue that the system forgot its lessons and what one could would be true with that and high-speed trading and other things that they've forgotten about. But in terms of cutting-edge innovation, um, I would say that the, the best example I can give you of a system allowing the train to run a bit off the tracks to learn and see is that example of savings and loans as a, as a good example of what a new technology, a new age, a new paradigm does with the system. It learns, it acquires, and then it, 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 it consumes, basically. It consumes that into itself. So that's, that's what's happened before and that's what's happening now unless we look up and outward and backwards and forwards we look around the, like yeah. a, a couple of questions related to that um good um what is the difference between do you think between uh, blockchain and savings and loans as a um, uh, um as a as a new a new sort of playground to create these new types of systems and um um, I was going to bring you back to the um, act from 1796 and then perhaps mm -hmm. fast forward to the bank, the 19th, like how 1930 or 1933 was a relevant time, um, a significant time oh. in the new, new sorts of systems we uh, live under today, um, bank for in and the bank for international settlements. Sure. Oh. Um, so I think the, um, so a few questions there. So the, again, the, fir the first one, can we go through them again? Just the first one? The, the first one you asked? Oh, the you first couple one is, there. What's, what's, the dif um, what's the difference between saving between and, loans and loans and blockchain? And blockchain. Okay. In, in your opinion? There's, not a, there's not, not a lot of difference. I think that's the scary part is there's not a lot of difference. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cl classic example. The people in the sand pit, never saw themselves in the sandpit. They saw themselves as pioneering, new, new money, the world's my oyster, I can do what I want. Yeah, it's, it's my world. Um, so the, the attitude and the behaviours, the behaviours are almost identical. Um, huge amounts of wealth to a very small group of people who kind of got in there early, almost no ethical consideration to what that money was going to go into. There was very little, almost none, I think, invested in any kind of real social consideration, which again is a mirror of crypto. Virtually zero of crypto has gone to anything about the environment or poverty or slave trade or anything to help humanity. Um, I, I would say you, you're kind of looking at a, a perfect example of that. And I don't want to say that, but that's to me a kind of um, a, a good example of of history and perspective. Yeah. And of course, you can you can get technical and argue and say, well, yes, but it was different here, it was a different time, and that's where you start to split hairs and kind of say we're different. You know, that's different. I guess, I guess yeah? you could argue the defenses, the 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 ability to build the fort, as you mentioned last week, in blockchain is a bit more is a bit is stronger, you know, the, the technology to create more robust decentralized networks um, that are parallel and, and outside of, um, uh, outside of um, government intervention is, 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 more, is different to the centralized um, savings and loans products and pr perhaps, you know, prior more centralized virtual currencies that weren't able to um, kick off there. Well, that, kick, that, that puts us back to what we're saying, which is, is the power of, of considering the concepts of sovereign DAOs and, and, and meta DAOs. And actually, you're right. I mean, I, I completely agree with you that the technology and indeed the communities have the potential to be different. But really, the question 
is kind of looking back at the past. So one is a, a previous sandbox and behaviour. It's a generalisation, and I and I I know we're talking to a cutting edge group of people. Yeah, we're talking to people who actually want to see these things change. Um, so it is different in that respect, but time is ticking on that, and I don't know how the wheels. I give you a good example. Um, you can go and create a trust anytime. You can go and get one today. If you've got a lot of money and you've got a tax problem, you can hire people and they will tell you how to set up an offshore and all that can be sorted out for you. Yeah? You can look at some of the stuff that we've been doing and you can say to yourself, well, why can't we go and do it? And you'd be right, you, you can. The most dangerous position to be, however, is in the middle of the road. You keep coming back to this question of being in the middle of the road. Sovereignty, unfortunately, is an all or nothing situation. You're either sovereign or you're not. You're either independent or you're not. You either have the structures in place or you don't. There's no kind of middle ground. So if you want to establish those boundaries, which, which then changes this to something more, yeah, that this is a new paradigm, a new way. Liquid democracy is not a, a fun thing we're just spinning. It's actually something that has future and that this is the beginning of something and it is going to evolve into being more socially conscious and, and being socially aware and being certainly socially aware of, of real issues that people face in environment, poverty, injustice, you know, the resource, the biggest um, Injustice in the world, the biggest resource imbalance in the world is education. All these things can be hopefully embraced by communities that em also embrace those things. Um, it's just we've got to start. So, yeah, if, if people step in and go, yeah, yeah, we can go and do it, it's, it's understanding what's at stake it's, and doing the whole thing and not just saying, let's do it ourselves. We can do it. Let's do it. So if we built this, we're going to do it ourselves. You know, it is, it's more than that. It, it's, it's the universe that you create with all the boundaries that you need. You need a, a date and time system. One of the, the elements that defines you in their system is date and time. It's incredible. We use it every day. But date and time puts us in their universe. UK has spent years and years and years building its own date and time system. It's available. It'll be part of the sovereign Dow project. If you know, if and when it gets off the ground, it's it's part of it. Um, but there's an example: all these small steps. So you had a couple more questions for me, but yeah, you, you mentioned. Do you want to? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Go on. Space and time. Um, no, no, no. What were you going to say there, Frank? And then I'll. Would in. you? Well, just to say, did, are, the, are the questions that people want to ask me too? I just want to make yeah. sure that people. R Rich had a quest. Rich had a quest. A question. I'm just okay. writing down. Oh. Um, the because you mentioned date and time and there's we also had the 90 the bank for international settlements question and i also had a comment about what you're saying there which was that you know we see blockchain and cryptocurrencies as a sort of separate island um especially the younger generations we tend to just kind of go ahead and just try and build something completely brand new only to realize yeah. what we're building and the what we're creating is part of the a pattern of history that has been yep. that could be been been repeated, and so the uh, the valuable uh, component for us to actually build new and different and more benevolent and better fair systems is to go into the history and and really um, understand what these uh, current systems we are are living mm -hmm. in how would, how they were designed and 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 then taking it from there. So the. the your, the questions on on history is uh, I find I'm sure a bunch of people here also find fascinating and also quite enriching and for us to then go and dig deeper into and so um, it, it, I'm going to ask a question related um, that uh, Rich um, uh, brought up and um, he um, related to narratives and mythology and its and its relevance and how much can we say is quote unquote objective for example, isn't the opportunity to create new stories for people to believe in? Um, and in turn, is everyone just world building? Um, is uh, Eucadia or indeed Edgeware not just another story? Maybe it's semantics, but can we actually separate story from process? 
is the difference just the consensus position? Um, is a country not just the biggest shared myth? Well, um, when you do get to talk to Richard, so thank you. He's he's structured one there. So, look, f first off, um, you are all part of creating a story. We are all part of, we are making a story. We're reaching out across space and time and trying to connect what we know, um, hopefully towards a, a common good. And I hope people see that, that common good and personal good um, are mutually beneficial. They're not mutually exclusive concepts. Um, story and mythology and law, funnily enough, are actually intertwined. Law originates from the mythology and the story. It always has, and, and, and frankly, it always will. Always will. It's why banknotes are drowning in mythology. Look at a banknote. You can spend, people pick them apart forever. There's websites on the mythology of, of, of uh, banknotes. So that tells you that, that it's, it's, it's still an intrinsic part of our, of our future. I think sovereignty, um, when you do things, it sometimes gets lost in translation to another generation. They'll look at the changing of the guard, Mondi money, the blessing of gold in the reserve bank or the visitation of the gold by the monarch. They look at these things and kind of see them as kind of quaint and old and a little bit outdated or, you know, great for the tourists, but people kind of sort of chuckle. In fact, um, every generation needs to find its own heroes, every generation and its own villains, and every generation believes, or uh, should believe, that it's writing its own story. I think people believe that, that, that you're, you're blazing a trail, that you're the world creator. So I don't think world creation itself is a bad thing, and I think people should be encouraged to go and try and create worlds. Certainly we have people talented enough to do that. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't hear statements out from um, good old Mark Zuckerberg there and talking about his vision of the world and go, okay, that's done, you know. The metaverse is, is done. I don't think people should do that. And if people have an idea of how a metaverse should be and even, even approximating Mark Zuckerberg's bubbly head version, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, go and, and do it. Um, countries, yes, countries themselves are, in one sense, uh, they're archetypes, but they're also constructs. They're mythological constructs. Um, they, they exist by virtue of history. Boundaries are arbitrary. They're not physical. You don't go to a country and discover, well, some you do, but you don't discover in the rocks that the red line is there like you see on a map. It's a, it's a human decision. But that boundary you find will have a story to it, a history to it, that that was a boundary for a previous country or a previous province if it was part of an empire or a previous overlord or a great battle fought over that boundary, that that land has meaning. And so I don't think the story can ever be discounted. I don't think the fact that mythology in, is in, embedded in us and that at the end of the day we are narrators and that we see the world through our own lens and, and I see it through my lens and Richard sees it through his lens and everyone on this call or who listens to it will see it through their own lens. The question in all of this is, well, several questions, but one in particular, kind of wrap it through, is how do we harness that potential, that creativity, that ability, in a positive way, not a destructive way, yeah? In a, in a building way, not a cancelling way. And I think that's probably the, the challenge that every generation faces and and certainly this generation, the high talent pool in blockchain especially faces that, the kind of cancellation effect sometimes. Because we, I'll give you an example. The second section on positive law, which I can't give you tonight, but we'll give it the next time we have a chat, is about understanding how to argue, the stories of argument, how we structure dialectic, for example, something that is just not taught at school. 
the idea that you can essentially set up a, a position, a theme, we broke ground. I have a position. You have a position. A, a, any group here have a position. And what we're trying to do at the end is not fight as gladiators to see who's standing at the end, which is what we think is winning an argument. What we want to get at the end is synthesis. That is to say, because we agreed on a common theme, and even though we, we may start miles apart, that we can come together and actually produce something that's better than what each of us individually had done. So we think in many ways the absence of that knowledge and the absence of those tools has lessened the potential and the ability to build. But you're seeing it, people wanting to listen to this call, people wanting to, to look at the ethical framework of Edgeware and Polkadot and Kabutcher and, and, and um, Kasama and other communities. This is, this is fantastic. This is beginnings of that. And, and you don't want to kind of roll over that because that's people themselves wanting to see that happen. Uh, and I'm not here to, in any way to roll over that. So I think Rich's question is a lot of dynamics to it. But at the end of the day, the mythology is its strength, not its weakness. Because at the end of the day, we're human beings. We, we live by, exist by our own story. And that's really what it is. And the difference between what is fact and what is fiction, what is construct and what is real, ends up being hair splitting. It's how we harness our worldviews and how we learn ways to better cooperate that I think is the best opportunity. Not worrying about whether talking about some of the aspects of what Katie has done is or isn't real or whether current story is or isn't real. We need to know what things are. We need to label things what they are. We need to better – I'll give you a good example. Another good example. We said this last week, decentralization. Decentralization is one of the bedrock ethos concepts that distinguishes these communities, distinguishes probably most, if not all, the people here, that there is a, a strong affinity with the idea of decentralized uh, organizations. Yeah, it's embedded. And I think that's fantastic. But what is a decentralized organization and how do you actually build better decentralized organizations? Well, the kind of antithesis of that or the kind of paradox of that is, is actually designing better structured points of origin in terms of rules of how to function decentralized, which seems odd. If decentralized is all about not having a center set of rules. But in fact, that's where we lose perspective. And I think in building things, some of that's been lost, that some of the strongest structures are when you understand that the rules or the registers or the elements begin from a central source, again, consensus, how it's all it's agreed, but then becomes the centralised. Rights is a good example. You know, rights in a decentralised structure, if everyone knows what the rights are, is a powerful, powerful thing, and technology does it. But if you don't know what your rights are, then you're going to have people falling over one another, you're going to have loose things here. You've seen the evolution of how things have, 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 you're a part of that. So it's a good question, and I think I've um, hopefully done it to death. But anyway. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, that was a useful answer to um, uh, Rich's question. and. You mentioned um, the what came up for me there was that you mentioned fiction, and I know how that has mm -hmm. a relevance in law. Um, in and and could you speak a bit more about um, what like fiction is uh, and and um, and its relevance? Well, okay, law, law law to function um, is a binary system, so law essentially makes decisions on what is or what is not. Um, and on, on surface, that seems logical. If, if you're into programming, we deal with zeros and ones, ifs and thens. There is, you know, rarely do we get into the, the, the difficulty of, of multivalence or multi-threading. And if we do, 
uh, we know it's a nightmare. <laughs> so, you know, g- give me binary every day if you're into programming. Um, and, and that's what law presents on the, on the surface. So in law um, and in the systems that support law, there is this emphasis in dividing things into good, bad, right, wrong, fact, fiction. The reality is, and a good example of this would be if you think about a case, a court case, a criminal case. Rarely is a, is a criminal case what they would say cut and dry. That is, the evidence is overwhelming one or the other. In almost every case, um, when there's sort of serious criminal matters, unless it's just random mayhem, chaotic terror, um, the truth is somewhere in between. Now, you know, if someone's been killed, someone's been murdered, it's, it's a horrible thing. At the end of the day, you know, the, the, the people who did that need to be held accountable for that. But the extenuating circumstances may be there was a home invasion, for example. Yeah? Someone invades your home. Yeah? Um, they invade your home, they beat up your family, you, you, you defend yourself, and they run off. Now, instead of you staying in your home, you chase the people down the road and you kill one of them. Yeah? So now you find in the law that whole extreme circumstance, you could be charged for murder and you will go to prison. Even though the circumstances leading up to that fully justified potentially, your fear they come back again, you fear they know who you are, the fear they'll never be charged, all of those things, the sense of justice. That's, a, to me, a good example in law where the law physically can't cope with that. So what the law does is it boxes things in. It starts to hive things off. It says it's a extend, not an extenuating circumstance. And fact and fiction is one example where 200, well, probably 300 years ago, there was no such thing as fact and fiction. It was all story. That's an amazing concept to think that 300 years ago, there wasn't this idea of dividing things into truth and falsity. If a story was rubbish, it was a rubbish story. People wouldn't come and listen. Pretty simple. If, if you were bad at telling stories, people wouldn't pay you money and they wouldn't come and listen. Um, there was no such thing as fact and fiction. But as law progressed, as the financial system progressed, as the need to finesse progressed, they made this division and said, well, some things are fiction, some things are fact. The binary system that does it, logic itself, is absurd. But it's the only way that we can essentially put anything out of the sausage machine. Um, The preface on that is having the safety caps around that to make it work, and and they have been broken, and that's what makes it unjust and cruel. And that's where the civilised principles at least, uh, I was going to use the word tether, and I thought it's probably bad, karma to use that word, but it's it's where you need to be able to um, balance out the flaws of the system by ensuring the principles and rules around it. And there's another example of thinking about systems, the balance between, say, decentralization and rules. And that's, and that's yeah, fiction and fact. Hmm? Thanks for that. Well, that yeah. was fact. That was and, fact, and, actually. Awesome. <laughs> Um, and I know there's more to say on on the on the fiction uh, the fiction side of things in relation to the person uh, and things like that. But before that, but um, we can h- hold that for another time. Um, uh, Jamie um, had a question. Uh, he he'd like to know more about, and I'd like to know more about a Eukadia's approach to date and time. Oh, so um, understanding the date and time is a a sort of shorthand way of establishing what universe you're existing in. Um, In building Acadia, we conceived of a different date and time structure where we're able to identify not just the the segments of time as we view it, but to go back to some of the historical segments and start to extrapolate out. The question was, starting from fresh, could you come up with a more accurate time system? And that's what we did, a time system that, um, is more accurate over 100,000 years than any, or even 10,000 years than any system that they're using, 5,000 years. So um, 
the cave basically breaks down uh, time. Uh, there's, firstly, there's a connection between date and time and numbers. So the, the idea was to recognize, keep it really simple. Hearing and that we're stuck to our identity. You know, right. We're really stuck cool. to it. And how cool. do we detach? How do we detach yeah. through okay. understanding? Okay. Okay. So you're right. I mean, volu- the system is designed around the, the assumption that you're essentially volunteering. And they use words like, do you understand in court? Um, the nature of letters. So there's a whole history in their legal structure that essentially argues silence is consent, all these are examples, yeah, sign, consent, that, that, that they play this little game. And, and, the, and the, think of it from this way. Judges used to put a mortarboard over their head when they did death sentences, and I think they used to still do that up until the last case of the death penalty in the UK, okay? Is to pick up a black mortarboard and hang it over their head when they're reading the death sentence. In America, they don't care anymore, right? Just like you're, right? But that's they used to do that. And the reason I mentioned that is that we talk about secular systems, it's all structures, all mechanical, and we talk about mythology and stories and religion, and we... I haven't even really spoken about religion tonight, I don't want to, but what's with the mortarboard over the head and what's for the volunteerism? And the volunteerism um, and the argument is they could quite easily not have to do that and we'd still do it, right? But the volunteerism is not for us, it's for them. It's essentially creating a system where whatever bad energy they've created because they've duped us, They've worked us into a grave, they've poisoned us, they've enslaved us, and they lived an entirely parallel existence. That bad energy doesn't come back to them. And now it sounds odd, but there's a big part of that in that system. Yeah? There is actually a big part of that 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 when you're really wickedly awful in the middle management layers of that system doing horrible things, that that kind of wickedness doesn't come back and bite you, yeah? So I'm just saying that's part of it. Um, The real issue, you can spend, as I did, years discovering all the tricks that they do to get you to volunteer. And that's, and some people want to know that. They say, well, give me an example, give me another example, give me another example. And the response at the end is, I'm going to throw those tricks back. And that's, that's the kind of, uh, outlaw outcast and it never ends well and I'm in no way saying to anyone to go down that path I don't believe there is any benefit there is an alternative and the alternative is, is actually quite elegant you can belong to more than one society you are free to associate hurrah it's just or huzzah you know, hurrah it's just um, who you associate with hopefully can provide to you a level of knowledge, a level of fraternity, uh, and and even potentially some sovereign uh, tools that allow you to approach some of these difficult situations that come into life where you can say, well, guess what? By belonging to that society, they can help. I'll give another example. Look at the Masons. They're not just penguins that gather under strange lights on a Friday night. They are actually uh, uh, an example of a, of a fraternal organisation that has deep roots, you know, judges being masons and there's lots of stories of that and I have no problems in people being masons, none. They have you know, great um, dining facilities and, you know, long meetings, funny dress codes, but they have good buildings and, you know, a, a good long-term pension plan. The thing is, there's an example of a community, a society existing within this society that provided its members with certain legal benefits, sovereign legal benefits. They may not call them that, but that's what they do. Um, the Jewish community is another good example. Yeah? And I say nothing negative about that, but it's a good example of a well-organised, well-structured community that has succeeded in having some legal matters dealt with entirely internally. The Law Society, probably one of the best examples, the the guys that are running the courts 
are their own society, deal with their own deals. Doctors, another example, deal with their own matters. So I think what we need to recognise is that this is not new. Being an island in this system and trying to collect all the coins you can possibly make might get you there, but it might also end badly for people. And when people can connect together and find fraternity, which is you know everyone tonight, hopefully, and people who listen, there's enormous potential to, for life to be happier, better, smoother, less stressful. I mean, I think they're, they're good things to aspire to. That's what we do. We're not making grand... I don't think there's any need to make grand things. We're going to issue a passport or we're going to drive us license, all things you can do, but that's not the thing. It's it, At the end of the day, when we're under attack, when, when people are hassling us, how does it make us feel? It's not pleasant. Would it be nice to, 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 to be more relaxed and not be fearful of those things and, and do some good stuff, feel good about yourself, still have a happy life and, you know, the success you want, but with a little bit more happiness built in, less stress. I think that's a good aspiration. Yeah. Do some good in the world and, and, and feel good and safer about it. That's, that's really what this is about. That's central what it's about. Yeah. So I guess, I guess the goal is to, uh, is to, is to have a remedy for the mal design of the function of certain functions of society we live in that we don't, uh, that we think can be better. I mean, that's a lot, many people here, including myself, are, you know, are working, are motivated to see what the current design flaws are and try and build, build something better based on that. And what yeah. we're seeing is more and more um, lack of ethics in many of the functions of, of society and, and the industries and, and more and more the people that are being affected who seem to be people than, other than us are, is it, that, that is slowly coming toward, it feels like some t- in waves that's coming closer and closer towards us to the point where um, a lot of people are starting to, you know, like really feel the impact of of um unethical decision making or you know you bring up masons and sort of secret you know secret secret doctrine secret agendas perhaps starting to have their way in in uh centralized decision making on a global scale um and and you know the question is how do we how do we counter that and how do we you know how can we have more of a uh, a stake in the decision making of that, and how do we remedy um, the? You know, as you say, you bring up Mark Zuckerberg, and there's many other technocratic, mm. technocratic leaders in society mm. that are making these that are essentially use you know have their own doctrines and they have their own biases, and mm. they they have the ability to you know use their charisma and use their um, their cachet and their influence to implement to help implement these things and many people agree many of their peers agree with them and but many other people don't agree with with these um these uh the impact of their decision making and their long-term strategic goals so how can we design better systems that um counter that how can we bake ethics in and how can we remedy that essentially well i think i think um look i've 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 made passing comments tonight or today and I've made made them last week, but I, I really do honestly try and separate discussions on systems and failing systems and failing methods to people. I I it took me most of my life to get there. <laughs> still still struggle. But I, I think um the issue is not people, even though it's people that, you know, launch the slings and arrows and everything else. I don't blame people. I think we're talking, as you said, we're talking about systems. We're talking about failing structures and architectures. Um, 
it starts really with knowledge. It starts with these types of calls. It starts with really getting in depth and understanding things that may not have been clear before and hopefully become clear in what you're reading and the dialogue that people have. That's the first, because if, if you don't have that discernment and you can't make distinctions, then you can't then make an informed choice because the next stage, once you've got some, you don't need to know everything. No one needs, I don't need to, I forget most of what I've ever read. Um, it's hard to kind of keep it all, you know, it's, it's you know, read it and move on. Um, once you've done that, the second thing, once you have that certain clarity of, okay, I now can see the differences. I can see civilised law and uncivilised law. I can see the benefit of having a set of rules versus the kind of Wild West chaos. Then the next choice that people have to make is commitment. And I said this last week and I'll say it again. Either you can't be both. And I think someone asked the question. There was a, I kind of tried to give it. You, 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 there is no law in piracy, despite what it appears. Law is moral. So either without, without law, there is no longevity. Sovereignty is just a description of it. But without law, there's no longevity. There's no survival. There's no legacy. It's just a, a wild ride and another sandbox gone. You have to make that personal choice. Where do I stand? And I get it when people say, I don't want to go down that path. I'm too invested in having a good time. You know, I'm making good money. I've got a good job. I've got interesting friends. You know, hey, I'm popular. I wasn't popular at school. Now I've got money. I'm popular. I get all those things that come with the, the ride. Yeah. It's wild. It's, it's a bit frantic. It's going to come up again. All that. Um, and it's not a condemnation if you, if you can't make that choice. Yeah. And, I, and I, that's what I shared before. I didn't want to, personally, I would have been happy to, to have that kind of life and just write screenplays and play music and write code and just kick back and never worry about this stuff. But life, you know, my life and things, you end up, this is where you find yourself. You have to make that choice. So I did make that choice. I, I made that choice to say I'm committed to this process. Yeah? Yep. Didn't we read the fine it. print. Didn't read the fine print on it. Didn't say 30 years. It's just, just it's like that Santa Claus movie, you know, Santa Claus, where he, you know, Santa falls off his, uh, off his roof. Um, well, you mentioned about the 70-year cycle. There's like 70-year cycles, don't you? So 30 years. Yeah. You've you got 40 more. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't say that to me, Ramsey. <laughs> Um, Seventy anyway. years is the the age. It's a roughly the time of uh, people retire the retirement age, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get five, five designed, minutes of, not for you, but I'm saying five, you, <laughs> how they've designed it into they've baked that in. It's, it's, it's designed. It's yeah, you 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 work, you retire, and then you die, basically, and then then they change that paradigm a little bit. They so, sort of so. added extra years. Yeah. So once you commit, once you commit that you actually do want to invest something that means more than just life and the consumption of life, which is fine. Now it's about how. And the how is the checklist of all the things we've spoken about. It's about time systems. It's about personal identity. It's about belonging to a structure of law. It's about embracing that law. It's about converting that law into the contract system you're dealing with. It's about using that tool set to embrace so that as a decentralized community, all those things are clear. And, and there you've got it. So it was a long answer. I'm sorry, but I hope I got there. Thank you. That's great. So Moon asked, asked a great question there, which is, what's your, Frank, what's your number one concern with how the UK system could be gamed? Ego. Ego, and it's and it's the it's the it's the one variable that can't be locked in. You can't, uh, and the best way for for me to describe it is tonight. I show you, and the people that listen to this call and go to the whiteboard will read the introductory section. Yeah, 
Some will read it and take it as personal knowledge. Some may share it. Or some may think, hey, this is cool. I'm going to post it on a forum and I'm going to show people how smart I am or whatever. Or some may just take at it and say, I'm here to create a dissertation that it's rubbish or add an ad hominem to try and stop people from reading it. Any number of those variables. But each one of those variables has the element of ego involved in it to some degree, yeah, including mine. So the one variable that is unknown with Eucadia is whether people will treat a lifetime of accumulating knowledge and replacement systems as the precious from Lord of the Rings that they can't give up. And I have to say what's taken the longest time um, is I have experienced that more than once and we'll probably see it again. What I, what's changed now is it's no longer up to me to worry about that. That's, that's how people interact. Ego is what we are, yeah? And that there will be good days and bad days. There'll be people that do rotten, scoundrelous things. There'll be people that do great things. And this time, the quality of the information and the way it's structured, it's, it's not for me to judge. That, that's, that's my ego and my arrogance doing that. And it's time to get this out accept that there are doorways opening, process it through, but then ultimately let people in a decentralised world deal with the reality of life. And some people will weaponise knowledge, as they have and do. Some people harness it. But uh, there's no real weaknesses in Eucadia in that respect. The real weaknesses, as I say, are ego, uh, beginning with my ego. And uh, the effective transference of this knowledge in a way that leaves uh, it and, and, and makes sure that it is applied uh, in its best way. But they're not fixated on that if it's not perfect, that I'm butting in again and again to say, no, no, you've got to fix that. That's, it's, it's accepting that once these pieces that are part of the architecture of Ukadia do become decentralised, they're decentralised. And that's the biggest challenge with decentralized systems. Um, it's why you have to spend the time setting them up properly. Because what is a decentralized system if you keep collapsing and starting again? It's not decentralized. That's not decentralized. Um, we're talking about systems that once you set them up should never have to be tampered with again. That's true. True decentralization is something that once it's set up, it's autonomous. Here's an idea. Has anyone ever thought of an autonomous financial system? truly autonomous financial system. It doesn't mean that everything's automated. It just means that the big things are taken care of. Yeah? It doesn't mean the choices of where things go. It just means that the, the, the overall architecture um, works. Well, that should be an aspiration. If we're talking about decentralization, I've spent just on that issue alone 25, 30 years back to 2000 and five, whatever that is, more than I can think now, um, on that issue of financial, on tokens and accounting and budgets and what, what makes an autonomous system work and is it possible? So, yeah, it's, a, again, a long answer, but yep. the thing yep. that concerns me the most is ego, yeah? Right. Thank you, yeah. Um, and last week you... Uh, gave a definition for decentralization, uh, which mm. was broken down into three components tech, the technical uh, definition, social, and operational. Um, mm. And then you gave a definition of decentralization is the flow of rights, um, like uh, the flow of rights and power across the whole community or the whole society, mm -hmm. um, like a body. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in Many cryptocurrencies and crypto communities, let's say Bitcoin, for example, you know, there's this idea that Bitcoin's quite decentralized tech technically, but just mm -hmm. the arguments that there are also non decentralized component elements to it. Like, you know, the miners are quite centralized. You know, it's hard to mine Bitcoin unless you're a, you know, um, a big senior miner that part mm -hmm. of a big, bigger. Uh, conglomerate there and have uh, 
um, a lot a lot of resources. Um, and another element is that there probably half of all the Bitcoin is in um, in, in this less than one percent of wallets. Um, another thing is the governance um, decision making. Ashi handed over the website, um, the, the GitHub repo and the website to one person and the GitHub repo to another person to try and, you know, spread the, spread out the kind of centralized risk, but really it's quite centralized. Um, and I'm sure, you know, many like Edgeware has those issues too. And, um, other substrate based chains, I'm sure Polkadot has those issues into, and so how, um, you know, so there is a lot to be worked on in mm-hmm. refining and in, 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 in improving what the, what the definition, you know, what, what the definition of decentralization is and how to create these mm-hmm. sorts of these, the, you know, how to, and, you know, you, you've been working on, on these solutions for a long time, maybe not the decentralized mm-hmm. technology part, which is the Byzantine fault tolerance. But you know, in many other aspects, and it would be um, interesting to see how you know cause law, for example. I mean, I guess you can't take a community seriously as a country unless it has its own, you know, clear set of laws or bylaws, um, mm-hmm. and 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 then the functions, the functions of those laws that are set out quite, you know, explicitly and clearly. You mentioned last week about. Um, living on an island, if you're an island of one person, you don't really need much. It can be quite in, informal, or like if you're a, a small family, it can be quite informal. Mm-hmm. But as you get to a large, a certain a certain uh, uh, size, the the complexity there, you know, you need to have these. You need to establish, you know, some these set of rules and laws, and then have um, functions set in. So, um, what is I mean, these conversations is also are great for you know education, learning about history, mm. and then at the same time we can also start to um, define kind of steps forward in how to pilot and prototype um, um, and take an approach uh, and have a strategy to prove out these decentralized systems, not just technical decentralized, but also ones that are um you know uh, are robust enough to be a be a digital country or a, or even a both digital and a physical country i think i think um i think about this today i i think there's a watershed moment that i hope um evolves and i see this with kabutcher and i see this with um with polka dot and I see this with Edgeware and, and Kasama. It's moving to a position where you no longer kind of battling semantics, but you're kind of embracing a, a, a broader spectrum that accelerates development. Because one of the things that impedes development is where you find yourself down a rabbit hole or potentially wrong rabbit hole. And, and I, an example of this is I constantly use the word blockchain when we're describing these communities, yeah, rather than crypto. But uh, we've spoken about this to evolve beyond that, and we used to say network public as an interim description, yeah, or decentralised, digital decentralised, to then hopefully where we can talk in terms of sovereign, sovereign DAOs and metadaos, where it might sound a bit technical, but we, we've now reached a point that we are now technologically agnostic in that description to essentially appearing to be kind of firmly wedded and embedded on one layer of technology. And the reason I use that as an example is not to downplay blockchain, but to say that whenever thinking is out of balance, it's very hard to make educated and and discerning decisions in the community because the, a bias will appear and will affect that bias, yeah, and that and it will affect that bias, affect the outcome. Right? The bias affects the outcome, not the 
class effective bias. So uh, a, a way of seeing that would be the, this, this debate between centralised and decentralised, which is really born out of the blockchain technology itself. Yeah? I think it's better to view it as a paradoxical relationship where the two actually are codependent and that it's fit for purpose application and, and what each represents and each circumstance that matters. For example, in building a sovereign community, you need a set of strong, robust laws. I've said it. I've said it a thousand times in two sessions. Not a thousand. That's exaggeration. But I've said it many, many ways in the last, the last session and this session that a sovereign community, a true independent community of whatever construction needs a solid, robust set of laws, full stop, yep. that is a centralised function, a centralised project that must precede its decentralised application. That doesn't make decentralisation superior, nor does it make centralisation inferior. It simply says the implementation and the development have discrete requirements. Now, you see that right throughout. Another good, good one is governance. There's a, a way to apply liquid democracy um, in an effective way, brilliant in some, but not to take a bias that suddenly, as an ethos, we try and force fit that idea to each and every example. That's a failure of application. That's, a, that's a, an overreach that will end up creating disasters if it doesn't already. And another example is the egalitarian nature of governance. Governance has to be democratic, but governance requires certain skills. Why not at least identify at a bare minimum the skill set required of governance? So it's clear, even in terms of commitment of time, yeah? So there's at least a metric to recognise, yes, there's an egalitarian nature of people being elected to position, but there's also an obligation of position, yeah? And to view it purely as like a prize or a status or, a, you know what I'm saying? These are things that are human. We're all human. They come into it, you know? Someone has a title. Can't tell you how many times, you know, people come to me and I'm this. Great. Excellent. That's, that's you know, your label. But I think... If if the communities communities are able to look a bit out of themselves to see that it's not throwing it's not taking any none of this should be taking radical steps radical never ends well it's it's a it's a migration it's a path it's steps and it's not even straight. But one of those key ones is you've got to recognise the inherent bias that already exists and find a way to balance. And I think that's the thing with decentralisation, is I think decentralisation, why I raised it last week and I've raised it again, clearly there is a bias there that is clouding, I think, for the talented people you have, look, say another way to the people record, who listen to the call, what attracts me to talking, apart from the fact that it's time to connect, is that the productive capacity of a person on this call potentially is immense, given their skill set, their mindset, their education, their age, their interest, and the community itself. Extraordinary capacity. By that I mean the ability to build things, learn things, apply things, debate things, fix things. If this is an industrial revolution, and it is, it's equivalent to people here who can build ships, cars, mills, all kinds of things with their modern skill set in technology. What's holding that back? In some, there are many things that hold us back, doubt, knowledge, you know, whether we want to do it or not, whether we're having too much of a good time, but another one of those things to keep in mind and, and put on the record is the inherent bias of how the community has evolved. And not to throw it away, 
but just to be mindful of it and is some of the reaction to these questions of centralization, decentralization, really kind of a semantic debate that just should be left to one side and to say fit for purpose. This element gets born out of a centralized project. It gets applied in a decentralized manner. Two thumbs up. Yeah. I think that's that's widely kind of accepted anyway. The idea that um these decentralized systems are baked out of a a startup foundation, a startup company, a, uh, a core team. Um, Edgeware has tried their best to, uh, in on some aspects, uh, decentralize the beginning stuff. But always there is, I mean, ideas can always be proposed by one person and projects get funded that might be hugely in, uh, influential to um, the community that is from a core team, like Kabocha. <coughs> was focused on by a few people that was accepted uh, and mandated by the community to go and do. So yeah, there is there is that kind of um, um, understanding and allowance of that of that dynamic between centralized and decentralized. Um, but so just for just um, it, we've 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 hit about two hours on this call and uh, lots of really interesting stuff. Um, has been said there and inspiring and draw a lot for people to process, including myself. Um, so um, how would you, um, I guess a good question would be like, shall we um, repeat this next week or shall we go into a seminar? Um, how how would you like to proceed? And well, if anyone has any okay. final wrap, wrap up questions, that would be. That'd cool. Be well. Look, any other questions, go, go for it. And again, it, it's no problem if people um, um, haven't got one at the moment. We can always table them. I think that's another thing I said to you is, yeah. Sometimes people it did happen actually over the week. You mentioned there were a couple of questions that people had. Um, if you come up with a question during the week, um, or people who listen to this come up to questions in the week, then um, I think it'd be look. It's it's entirely up to the group. Let me separate firstly the the concept of seminars. So, uh, so I I've done a number of seminars. You've put the links up. There's a revision in the law explained or the law decoded um, to really uh, package it in a in an easier fashion because it so a lot of this can be quite dense and because things are connected it's easy to spin off in one direction or another. So what I said to 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 you Ramsey during the week is um, UK is going to do that domain knowledge in in recasting those, but what I can do through these Q and A is give people on this call, uh, I use the word, it sounds like a special offer type thing, it's, it's not what I mean, but an ins it, if you're talking to me and I'm doing this, I'm happy to share with you what I'm doing as I did tonight and give you an inside track on knowledge that's going to come on like positive law, which has a direct relationship. It's kind of like a personalised seminar really where I'm able to share with you. What I would ask is that people who were able to be on and people who do listen to this call, that you go and have a look at the material so that uh, we can engage as we go. So when I introduce another piece, that it's not simply an unanswered or that we use this. I, I'm, I'm here to answer questions. I'm here to share. Um, I'm here to introduce myself. I'm here to introduce Acadia. I'm, I'm here to, at the end of the day, establish deeper connections to everyone. That's why I'm here, yeah? Um, so I'm happy to continue if people find that that is useful and fruitful. Um, if they don't, um, then I'm, I'm cool by it. I'm, I'm cool what people have. I'm no short of things to do. <laughs> sure. um, but, yeah, um, I, I just feel this is a – a less formal way and the idea of a, a proper learning cycle and revising is something that within the UK sphere is being revitalised. So I want to keep that there. That will be available as it comes on. Obviously, we can link it through and make it available as a resource, but I can equally make available material that's coming off the presses. When the, for example, when the argument um, and reason section of positive law is ready, I would like to 
introduce it to to you guys if people want to see it read it it's amazing stuff it's all about how to structure things it's how to great knowledge for 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 dialogue and how to cooperate and 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 get your point across it's knowledge that is not taught anymore so it's it it used to be standard fair so yeah i'd love to do that if people want to do that it's up to it's up to you that'd be awesome i mean i we're we're anticipating look at the end of the day like you know there are trends in crypto and like a lot of them are flash flashy trends like you know the nfts and dows the lot you know dows are longer burners and um are um going to be you know they've they've emerged you know over the past year um nft just started off the you know and things like that and we are anticipating that you know the questions that are being asked in in crypto right now is the idea of the network state what is a network state what is a digital country and how what can we really do with these communities and how can we make them more autonomous um uh, have have more sovereignty and things like that and so we'd love to on behalf of other people listening as well we'd love to you know continue this exploration um mm-hmm. for the for you know for those benefits and and you know i can imagine in uh in the next wave or the wave after it, it, you know whatever shows up in crypto is it's going to have systems not just have DAOs that are you know um internet communities with a coin with a bit of governance but actually have more you know act- an actual system of law that can start to be you know really in, in influential have ethics baked in just be like a country and be a society mm. and and so uh, we'd love to continue ex- exploring that and you know this is the reason why we in ask you to come and and uh, con- contribute is because we want to minimize the all the mistakes and the guesses that we have to make in order to do those things because i'm sure you've made many of you, know, you have a bunch of knowledge a bunch of uh, hardened experience in in and and a bunch of and a bunch of mistakes, mistakes that, that we which are some, some some of which are on still recorded facebook on the internet some are fake mistakes baked into yeah, the yes <laughs> time stamped yes time stamped Frank made that failure, failed there. But this is what I shared with you to, to, in perspective. I think it's important. It's not an arrogant statement, but those 50 pages I've shared with the group tonight and those that listen is more than three decades of work distilled into everything I know, crystallised these things as the beginning of a journey to truly create powerful, long-lasting DAOs and SANS and sovereign digital communities. This is where you have to start, regardless of where you think you need to be. This is where you have to start. And I've shared that with you tonight. It's my commitment to you that I, I see many benefits in developing this. One is, as I said, UK is an open source model. It's an open source system. And it's open to people who accept the knowledge and the power and what it it can do. So really I'm doing what I need to do, which is decentralize Ucadia. There are parts of Ucadia that I'm still working on, but here's a way of, of developing that and sharing that knowledge. So yep, if people want me to be, be around next uh, next um, Monday, I'm happy to and then share some more. But I would I need the feedback. I want to see that people can read it um and if you find stuff you don't agree with t- tell me i'm as i said last week too i have no problems if people have an issue with this or with me i, I don't have i don't have a problem with that and if they want to raise it raise it um it's a it's a dialogue it's not a monologue i'm trying it not to be a monologue yeah and i'll do my best and if anyone else wants to come on and and and, and uh, contribute in in video and voice please what you're welcome to and uh on if this call as this call is recorded and we go online i will make the materials available to to people listening after um afterward and um 
um, I will try my best to bring more objections of, of um, you know, anticipate what people's objections might be when you're um, um, to whatever you're saying so that it can help to uh, improve the discussion further. And I'll try my best to be better at that as well. Oh, so, yeah. Terrific. Well, thank okay. you. And thank you. I hope people um, found tonight interesting and I hope people find the material interesting. It, it, it is directly relevant to sovereignty, so, sovereignty um, and it is relevant to creating digital communities because the first section I've showed you is what is a, a civilised society or not. It, it's actually there. It gives you that answer. Yeah. Amazing. We can explore that. Hopefully we can do the same time next week. Same time is fine. And um, I'll have other material to show. And again, it's all building towards the real and practical. None of this is about theory. It's real and practical towards actually building sovereign digital communities with all the elements you need. That's why we're doing this. But we're doing it together, hopefully. And we're doing it with people collaborating and involving and and um supporting brilliant um thank you frank and hopefully this gives people a flavor of what's you know what's to come and and uh the platform is here now and we can make a rhythm out of it you know a weekly thing hopefully and uh and um start to implement um uh stuff and please yeah provide your feedback so it can help improve um the conversation